Somebody says, well, what's, the, what's the point about timing? Why is, why is timing so important? Uh, why does timing have a great emphasis? Um, anybody, anybody can get you a diamond ring. Any, anybody, maybe not anybody. <laughs> There's a lot of people that can go to the store and get you a diamond ring. But when somebody gets you a diamond ring when they mad at you, that's, anybody can buy, anybody can go and if, if they plan and they organize, they can get you a gift. They, they can say on Christmas, they can say, they can bring you to the uh, driveway and say, da-da, that's your new car. You know, that's, that's what you do when you do it. You say, well, da-da, and you take it um, But the timing, but, but the timing. How do you feel if somebody gave you a new car and their car just died? Mm, right? It's, it's, it's different. It's not that you just gave a gift. It's not that you just showed an act of love. It's when you did it. It's the condition that you did it in. You showed your love and we wasn't even good. Sin hurts God. So while, while you, look at, the, look at the text, while you are hurting God, Jesus says, I'm going to show how much I love you when in our, our perspective, you don't even deserve. We like to, in, uh, uh, in our society, we like to do things based upon what we think people deserve. So somebody, some people say, you know, you don't deserve my time. You don't deserve my money. You, no, no, no. Matter, matter of fact, give me that back. You don't deserve that anymore. You did, when a person does X, Y, and Z, when a person does X, Y, and Z, we start walking around looking for, uh, we become repo men. We, we become repo Christians. And we start going around, give me, give me my what? Give me my stuff back. Have anybody ever took back something? Come on, church. <laughs> <laughs> when they, <laughs> my brother, my brother said they tried. He moved it. <laughs> he put it in a different location. <laughs> he walked in. What you looking for? Yeah. <laughs> get, get your stuff. Leave my stuff alone. <laughs> if you ever went and tried to go repo or, t or try to take something, it's because you were mad. Matter of fact, you may have even been justified while you were mad. And so what we want to do is, when you get mad, ma matter of fact, m being mad is a human and a celestial emotion. When I say celestial, I mean heavenly. God can get mad, that's in heaven. Humans can get mad. So mad is actually universal. And it, and it, and it crosses the stratosphere. It can go through the universe and be in the angels. And it can come back and the same emotion that's in the angels can be in you. So being angry and being mad, that's worldwide, universe, that's eternal. Because God is eternal, so eternity can get mad. Have you ever thought about that? All right? But with that, when you get mad, a natural response, not just a human response, is what, what I'm trying to say, a natural response when you get mad, is you want to take your stuff back. Yeah. If you riding around in my car and you hurt me, get out. <laughs> get out and give me, hey, and, and give me the spare. <laughs> just, <laughs> and let me check the rest of your keys just, just in case you made some copies because you thought we were cooler than you, what we really were. Right? You want to take your stuff back when you get angry. You want to take your stuff back when you get mad. God is no different. So when you sin, what does God want to take? I want this to be very clear. What does God want to take when you get, when, when you sin against him, when you hurt him? Somebody says blessings. You can keep your blessings. What is God going to do with a blessing? 
when he is. I am. My presence. You have walked in a room. Not, the, there are, you don't need no presence. I'm here. You ever went to somebody's party and they'd be like, do you have any gifts? I am the gift. Listen, the gas I used to drive way out here and come at this time, I had other stuff to do. My presence is the present. Right? So, so if God is a blessing, what will he do what is he going to do with a blessing? God, God won't repo your car. What are you going to do with a car? He don't need your house. He can't even fit in it. God wants your clothes? You got blessed with your clothes. God, I don't want your clothes. Why would, God, why would God take something? Why would eternity take something that's temporary? I don't want anything to so here's the thing when if, if, if I go shopping if, if I if I go shopping I don't I don't go shopping in, in the baby section don't do it <laughs> I don't I don't there's a there's a certain size there's a certain size that I am right there's, there's a certain size I am matter of fact the clothes that I purchase are a manifestation of the blessing, they're really not the blessing. Your car is not the blessing. God is the blessing. Because without God, that car can turn into a curse. You said the engine? What is it? What is it, the engine? Or the rotor, what is a, what is a rotor? Okay, I gotta get that too? Yeah. Now it's a what? It turns into a curse if God is not there. Your house is not a blessing. Because if God ain't in it, it's a house. If God is in it, it's a what? It's a home. Right? So the material things are a manifestation of the presence of God. They're not God. Right? And so whenever you get something, you say, thank you. God, because the blessing just revealed itself. The cross is not the blessing. What makes the cross a beautiful place to look at and remember is that the one who what? There were three crosses that day. Did y'all know that? Which, which one are we happy about? The one in the middle. Why? Why is the one in the middle better than the other two crosses? It is because the presence of, of the blessing was there. Yeah. Because God was there, because Jesus was there, then that cross, which was ordinary wood, has now become the most beautiful place on earth because what? When God can make wood eternal. For thousands of years, what have we been doing? Thanking God for the cross, why? Because Jesus was on it. So, so a natural response, when God gets angry, why would he take back something that's temporary and will dissolve? So it can't be a blessing. So if God gets mad, what does he want to take? Spirit and life is the same thing. The only thing that is eternal in you is spirit. And because of God, he'll make your soul eternal. But your soul is not eternal unless God allows it to be. That's a matter of fact, your soul being eternal is the blessing, uh, the manifestation of the blessing of God how does your soul, notice this, how does your soul become eternal? What happens in baptism? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gets inside and then you become immortal. Y'all see that? You become immortal only when you come in contact with eternal. And when eternal gets inside, you become the blessing and you live forever. So then we tell everybody, come to Jesus Christ, because if you come to Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ now lives in you, and wherever Jesus is, nothing dies. Amen. 
that's when you have life, right? So, what did God give you when you were born? Matter of fact, scratch that. What did God give you when your daddy and your mama met? I skipped a step. You know, it's not just, they, they wasn't just saying hello. I, you know what I mean by when they met. When your mama and somebody says, <laughs> some people look at around like, I don't know. <laughs> That's not this class. That's not this class. <laughs> when your mama and your daddy met, <laughs> what did God give? In order for your mother to say, I'm pregnant, at the time of conception, God had to send spirit because anything without spirit can't live and grow. So even for the doctor to say, I, I hear or I see something growing in, something's growing inside of you before anything can grow, sex doesn't cause life. Sex can't create life. But when two people come together, God has to allow it and he has to send his spirit. And when God sends his spirit, then flesh begins to form and grow. Y'all see that? Now, when you sin against God, the only thing he wants back from you is the thing that he gave you. And what was the thing that he gave you? Because that's what gave you. He don't want your hands. He don't want your feet. He don't want your physical body. What happens to your physical body when it dies? Why would he, why would he take something that is decaying to heaven? Do, do you know that when you die, physically you won't look like, your bodies do not cross over. First Corinthians 15. I won't look like this. I look better. <laughs> because the Bible says we will look like him if we're in Christ. Right? So how, how God the Father looks at it is that our relationship now has the opportunity to be restored at the death of my son. At the death of my son, me and you can be well. So the Bible says, by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The same Jesus who died, the death stopped the, the repossession. Death stopped the, the repossession. The resurrection of Jesus Christ started the new life. If Jesus would have just died, we still would be in, in trouble because uh, uh, I don't know many of you been in that situation before uh, where the repossession uh, was stopped. They was finna come pick up your car, and you, you was able to make a phone call and say, "Hey, can I? Can you? Can you? St you can stop the repossession, but that doesn't pay the. Still don't pay the bill. Matter of fact, you you know what you would like for that bill to do? You would like for it to be buried." <laughs> So death means something has stopped. Something has ended, right? Death means something has ended. But when something is buried, that means it's covered. Yeah. That's where the blood takes place. The blood is in the burial. The blood, the blood is not in the death. The blood is in the burial. Death stops. The, the death is the sacrifice. The blood is in the burial. Now you're covered. That's why we don't just, that's why, that's why we don't take a little, you, you, you ever seen some people, uh, 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 some churches, you, you get some churches, and they start going, they start going around, and, and, they, and then they, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that, sis, I, I, I didn't think I had that much water still on me, but they do, they do the little, they do the little sprinkle. They, they do the little sprinkle. And they say, you are now what? You're now baptized? And the other person. And they get the, 
<laughs> and they get slapped in the forehead, right? They go to all that. You ain't been buried. That ain't burial. That's why when we baptize you, we don't put your toe in. We don't dip some water and throw it on your forehead. Do you know why they start putting water? Because you can't take babies all the way down. So what they did is they remixed baptism. Catholics remixed baptism and start pouring it on the head because you can't put babies all the way down. But babies shouldn't be baptized anyway because you gotta believe first before you come to Christ. So, so in that, the burial is where you're covered and then the resurrection is the promise of a new life. So it's the blood of Jesus Christ where you have what? Where you have peace. It is not the death of Jesus Christ. So what removes your sin is not the death of Jesus Christ. What removes your sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. It is the blood of Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood that has now made peace because the blood is the sealing of the sacrifice and it's the payment. Blood is the payment. Do you know why the death of Jesus Christ is not the payment? Because his body is flesh. You needed life for life. So what, what, uh, uh, what God did not want from Jesus was his fingers or his toes. Because it's not the body that can atone for sin, it's life. And, the, and, and anybody that's a doctor or a nurse knows that there's life in the, there's life in the blood. Matter of fact, when somebody's not well, they say, we need to, we need to have blood. So when somebody, when you find out what's wrong with you, when you check your cholesterol, you want to check your history, and they say, draw your what? We need, to, we need to draw some blood. So you need all them gallons filled with my stuff. You need all the with this whole pipe coming down from the thing and you're going to just keep drawing all my life. And so what they do is they take your blood and they examine it to find out who you are. The same thing is what Jesus shed on the, on the cross. Do you know your blood determines what you have, what you've been up to? You had a good week. You had a good weekend. Looks like <laughs> you've been ha you've been having fun. You've been having fun. Oh, matter of fact, by your blood, we can tell what your diet is. We can we can we can tell uh, what your recreational activities are. The blood don't lie. Matter of fact, you can say, no, I'm I'm healthy. Mm, now, according to your blood, something's going on. <laughs> Your, your, your blood's not healthy. Your blood is a reflection of your physical activity. Your sin can get in your blood. I know, I know this to be true. I know this to be true. Here, y'all ready to give y'all uh, some good Bible? Cain killed Abel. And when Cain killed Abel, God spoke to Cain and said, where your brother at? Cain said, am I my, hey amen, good, am I my brother's keeper? It's good to have a church that can that know you and go back and forth with you. <laughs> he said, what? I don't, I, don't, I don't know what he said. <laughs> he said, am I my brother's keeper? Do y'all remember what God said? God said, I hear Abel's blood speaking to me from the dirt. He's, his blood, no, no, Abel has already died and Cain has buried him and hid him. But God said, you may have hidden the body. It's the, it's the blood I hear and I have come down to ask you and question you about your physical activities because his blood is now testifying against you. That's why nobody gets away with murder. 
You think people got in the way of, you think somebody isn't called? God said, the blood will testify against you. So it's, it's the blood of the, what is communion? It is, he says, Jesus says, this cup is the new contract. That's what testament means, covenant contract. Every time you take communion, you are reminding yourself of the contract that Jesus made. Now notice this, while we yet in sin, Christ died. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus was talking about the love he was about to show and say, hey, listen, I want y'all to take communion. I, I, ain't, I haven't died yet. I'm about to die. But in the kingdom, I want you to keep drinking this cup to remind yourself I love you. And the blood is a reflection of the new contract and the new life we have in Jesus Christ. That's why even though an unbeliever may take communion, God doesn't recognize because you haven't signed the contract. How do you sign the contract? You got to get covered in the blood because you go, you die and then you go and become buried and get covered and washed in his blood. Revelation 1 5. Revelation 1 5 says it is actually Jesus Christ that does the washing away of your sins with his own blood. The Bible says Jesus spiritually, if you come in obedience, he gets in that water with you and he washes you in his own blood. That's the burial. And then from that, you have a new life. I'm going to make some statements. Don't. I'm pure. And at this moment, I have no sin. And I'm clean. I'm innocent. And I'm not guilty of anything. I have not offended God. I have not hurt God. I'm good. Would any of y'all make those statements? <laughs> you know why you wouldn't make those statements? Because you don't understand the blood of Jesus Christ. You think the blood is weak. So in essence, you think the church is weak. And you think that Jesus' power to forgive and completely remove is, sounds good, but it ain't real. Because you still carry it around in your conscience. If the blood completely removes sin, then what are you at that moment? Pure. If you tried to remind Jesus of the sins you did in 2015 and you're walking in him now, I ain't talking about somebody that's living in it, living in sin, but you're walking in him now, you've repented. Could Jesus, could God converse back and forth with you? You know what he would say? What are you, what are you talking about? I told you I forgave you. Why you keep, you know what? You repented for that sin last night. And then here you go again tonight and you asking for repentance of the same sin that I promised to forgive you 24 hours ago. Why you keep reminding heaven of something that's no longer on the record books? Now, I know you get this principle because when, when your creditor says your debt is forgiven you don't call the creditor back the next day and say you know what hey you know you don't bring up old stuff matter of fact you know what you get you say can I get a receipt can I get something in writing because if I get it in writing I promise this relationship with you and me is done <laughs> Well, even if your creditor tried to come back and say, hey, we found a uh-uh, 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 I got a receipt, it said paid in what? And God said, my word is telling you that your sins on the cross is paid in full if you live in me and you walk in me. Stop reminding yourself of stuff that you did in the past. You are forgiven 
the power of the cross. Do you know how many people walking around in guilt? You know how many people walking around saying, oh, I just, I, I try, I try. Oh, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be doing and, and you keep reminding, and God is saying, man, stop being a victim. <laughs> I'm so irritated at your victim speech while at the same time I gave you the victor's trophy. Who gets, who gets on the champion stand with the trophy saying, I should have practiced harder. I missed that shot in the second quarter. I should have, you know, I, you know, should have got some sleep. Should have, I should have just, I should have drank some Gatorade and got some more juice in me. I just said, but you, at the same, the whole time, you talking defeated with the, the victor's trophy in your hand. Here's something that's difficult in Christianity. God forgives us faster then we forgive ourselves. Another thing, Jesus forgives you faster than the neighbor sitting next to you right now. Here's the problem with the church. If you know your neighbor more than you know Jesus, you ain't gonna like church. But when you know Jesus, more than your neighbor, you can look down your whole aisle. It don't matter. You don't matter. Do it with love, though. <laughs> you don't matter. Because who do I know? I know Jesus Christ. <laughs>